Hello, good morning everyone. Myself, Dr. Rangalan Mahapatra. I welcome you to my YouTube channel, Microeconomics Online Lesson by Rangalan. So, first of all, I would like to thank you everybody for your uh, patience watching and your comments and your feedback. So, I am really very much impressed about your feedback. So, that's why uh, I am putting the effort seriously to give you the next lecture uh, on the content which I already uploaded in the last video. So, the present content of the video is we will uh, complete or we will cover about this the concept of uh, microeconomics, how the concept microeconomics was originated, and what is what the microeconomics does, what are the importances of microeconomics, and the additional significances of microeconomics, what are the implications of microeconomics, then the tools that we are utilizing in microeconomics, then the methodology of microeconomics, that is how we study or how economists they study microeconomics, then the positions of microeconomics, then the success and failures of microeconomics. So, this is all about the content of my video which I will complete in this video. So, the next one is the meaning and origin of microeconomics. So, generally, we students, whenever we study any book, we just they find about the uh, two or three lines or one page regarding the microeconomics and micro macroeconomics differences. But here I will present you the details, its history, its evolution, how the concept is now presently uh, utilized, everything. So, microeconomics is generally regarded as the price theory because in microeconomics, we study almost how the prices of the products are determined. And its discussion centers around the prices of the goods and the services. Therefore, so it is uh, sometimes it is defined as the study of the efficient allocation of resources among the competing uses by any economic agent that may be an individual agent or maybe a group of agent. So then the question is what is that efficient allocation of resources? The efficient resource allocation means in economic theory or in microeconomics, we will get certain conditions, certain requirements, which is actually uh, coming out of the mathematical uh, derivation. So there we will understand that if somebody is a consumer, how the consumer will utilize his given resources, that is the money income, to purchase the goods and services at a given prices of those commodities so that he or she will maximize his or her utility. Similarly, in also uh, production also, there is also the producer always, the firm always wants to maximize its profit, so he has to utilize the inputs, he has to produce the output, therefore, so he will consider that how the resources should be utilized optimally, that the, uh, it will be giving you maximum profit. So that the details of this efficient allocation of resources, what are the tools we are utilizing, that also we will uh, discuss in the subsequent slides. So then, the price, uh, repre what is that price? The price represents the value of the goods in terms of other goods. So it is called relative price. Whenever we talk of the price of goods, it is actually the relative price. It is not the absolute price. So, however, majority of the transactions today are made in terms of money and money can be converted into goods and goods can be converted into money. So, that is why money is actually universal uh, uh, mode of transaction and in India we utilize uh, or we use Indian rupee or our currency is rupee is the common denominator in the measurement of the prices in India. Then, we should go to the origin of the concept of microeconomics. Actually, whenever we refer to this concept, we must also refer to the economist, the uh, celebrated economist or the famous economist who have actually discussed those things. So, economics as a subject, it is divided into two branches. One is microeconomics and the other one is macroeconomics. So, the uh, famous economist, the Nobel laureate Joseph Stiglitz, in his uh, book, uh, The Principles of uh, Macroeconomics, he has discussed 
that the word micro is derived from the Greek word makros, micros, m i k r o s, micros means small or it is individual. Therefore, microeconomics focuses on the behavior of individual economic unit. It may be a consumer, it may be a farm, it may be a producer, it may be a household, it may be a government, it may be a producer in a market. So the economic agent may be individual or it may be a group of individuals or group of economic agents who can be treated as individuals. Similarly, by contrast, the prefix macro is derived from the Greek word macros, M-A-K-R-O-S, which means large or aggregate. Therefore, macroeconomics analyzes the aggregate behavior of all the economic agents such as the aggregate output, national income, national wealth, aggregate selling, inflation, unemployment, aggregate demand, aggregate supply, excess savings, investment, everything. So these are the concepts which is related to microeconomics. Now, what really microeconomics does? Because we just to finish our discussion that microeconomics deals with the individual economic use. No. There are something else also we must understand. It is the individual actually uh, who, who consumes and produces. produces. And if they are due to this globalization, production and consumption leading to pressure of competition between domestic and international market provides a lot of impetus to study microeconomics. Why? Because nowadays everything is competitive. We are competing not only with our domestic front, but also we are competing with the international front. So this globalization made everything a single unit, the entire globe is single unit, so everybody's production will create a competition for other producers, whoever may be, in which place. It's therefore the center of uh, analysis is actually the individual consumer or individual producer that leads to actually interest of uh, giving more intention or more uh, in-depth uh, focus on microeconomics. So microeconomic models, that is the theories which are generally we discuss in uh, microeconomics actually explains the consumer behavior. This is very important. Microeconomic theories, they explain the consumer behavior and producer behavior in specific markets and in general and the contemporary problems such as pollution, rent control, minimum wage laws, tax and subsidies, import quotas, and tariffs, food stamps, government housing and educational assistance programs, government health care programs, workplace safety, regulation of private firms, regulation of monopoly, legislation of MRTP and competition act which was in India. So that means we understand that not only it is only studying the consumer behavior, also we are applying to a large extent in a wider area where it is utilized like your tax and subsidies, how much tax will be used and what the basis of use of taxation, where tax will be optimal, how subsidies will increase the welfare, where, how it will reduce the welfare, everything that also we study. Similarly, the government educational program, housing program or program, all these are related to the welfare programs which are actually the uh, based on the microeconomic foundations. So the next one is the importance. So in what way this microeconomic study will help? It helps in formulation of industrial and trade policy and inclusive growth of the economy. We also study not only the individual farm but also the industry as a whole and what type of industrial policy should be made so that the economy will grow as well as it will also inclusive, it will consider all the people, the benefits of the growth will be shared by almost all sections of the society. The subprime lending crisis in USA in 2008 adds to the relevance of the examination of the behavior of microeconomic agents. So we must, all of you uh, must be aware that in 2008 there was a severe crisis all over the world because it started in USA which is called subprime lending crisis and that actually is actually the problem of individual uh, the banks uh, which uh, where the banks fail to provide everything and that uh, problem in USA spread it to all over all other countries uh, uh, of course India but uh, least affected. So they are that because of that problem also economists uh, reoriented their views and their uh, uh, attention 
move towards micro microeconomics because the, the agents who are actually uh, engaged in this uh, uh, subprime lending, they were unable to deliver the justice to the people. Therefore, the importance of microeconomics was actually increased and it could help uh, to solve the problem. Then, well, with this also what happens, the use of mathematics, graphs, geometry, optimization. Uh, in this optimization, we have Lagrangian multiplier, linear and dynamic programming has led greater precision and rigor rather than abstraction and distraction from the subject. So whatever we do, when we utilize this subject, we also utilize the other tools like which we will discuss in the subsequent slide. We use mathematics, we use geometry, we use graphs, we use algebra, which not, which, which does not uh, create the difficulty for the subject, rather it creates authenticity, it, it creates more uh, relevance to the subject, it, 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 it competes with the uh, most of the scientific, scientific subjects and it got its own value. So therefore, there are also some other significances of the microeconomics which we must uh, understand and we must uh, be aware of. The separation of microeconomic theory as an independent area which discourse from the macroeconomic theory. Now, many of the, the after in the 20th century, in the latter part of the 20th century, this microeconomic theory is considered as an independent area. Of course, simultaneously we are utilizing the macroeconomics, but the importance of this subject has been increasing a lot. Secondly, the split of the focus of microeconomic theory for solving isolated problems relating to the behavior of individuals or groups of consumers, farms, a market's collection of more general and more extensive explanation of observed microeconomic phenomena that articulate visions of how the microeconomic world operates. Like we must say uh, our environmental problem, our energy crisis, almost almost theories we also utilize and explain with the use of this microeconomic theory. Third, the nature of the microeconomic theory and how it accomplishes what it sets out to. So the nature of this theory or the nature of this subject is actually making itself as a distinguished subject or as a distinct sub uh, branch of economic uh, subject which uh, uh, is actually helping to do what it intends to do. So in addition to do, uh, this, the decision making behavior of consumer, farm, interacting behavior of consumer and farm in the operation of market and thereby the price mechanism directs for the allocation of resources, reaction of individual decision making to external forces and constraints impact on the economy of the government regulation. This is very important that we are not only studying how the individual economic agents they will utilize their resources but how their decision will affect the decision making uh, of power of the external forces of the government, how the government is, uh, government policy is regulated, how it is affected due to the individual decision making, that also we study in this microeconomic theory. The theory of savings and investment, farm investment, expands the decision of the means of transformation of funds from savings to investment, that is channelization of savings into productive investment, or is also based on this microeconomic foundations. The analysis of choices and outcomes relating to money and its impact, implications of individual decisions in macroeconomy are also the areas where the microeconomics focuses on. Then, the implications, what does it imply, what, uh, what it uh, says, micro and macro perspectives embody different ontological assumptions regarding agents and structures and different methodological assumptions regarding proper means of economic analysis. When we divide the subject into micro and macro, it has certain implication in the, uh, in the surface, in the background, so this we must understand. That is, the microeconomic perspective is based on atomistic ontology, ontology. That is, it is based on the individual uh, views that it gives much more importance to the individual actions which have some meaning in economics. Or in the economy, the individuals are the uh, be-all and end-all of everything. This is grounded in the 
general equilibrium theory of Leon Walras, who says rational behavior of utility maximizing consumers and producers will, under certain conditions, bring equilibrium in goods, demand, and supply. That means the these microeconomists they give uh, every almost all importances to the individual decisions. They think beyond individuals nothing is there. There is no meaning of the entire economic decision if you do not know what the individuals are doing, how the economic agents are doing their decision making uh, choices. So in this way, macroeconomics can be reduced to its micro foundations. That means, so whenever we study any kind of uh, 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 theory, if the individuals are given much more importance that then the macroeconomists like uh, I will come to them that uh, Lucas who got uh, uh, Nobel Prize in Economics, they say that everything, all the macro phenomena like national income, the behavior of all the individuals, there are all these macroeconomic theories, they can be explained through the microeconomic theories or the micro foundations. So the, thus, individual is responsible for his or her own economic welfare. That means we should not, nobody externally should bother about how the individual welfare will increase. It is the individual whose decision making power or he or she himself or herself is responsible for his or her own, own welfare. So it, it is the individual economic agent who decides how much should be the welfare. And therefore, this moral individualism led to distaste government interventions in economy. That means, that is why the microeconomic economic uh, theories, they always uh, have a uh, uh, low for flavor or a low taste for the government, government interventions in the economy. They say that individual decisions can bring everything, it brings equilibrium, it brings demand and supply equal. Then the, how do we analyze, how economists they analyze this microeconomic uh, theories or the models? Uh, the first one is the constraint optimization. So uh, then the second one is equilibrium analysis and third one is the comparative statics. So these are the three important tools uh, the microeconomic theorists they utilize to study or to explain the consumer, the behavior of economic agent. It may be individual economic agent or it may be a group uh, of uh, group of uh, economic agents who will be treated as units. So when we optimize or we go for optimization, optimization means you this converts the meaning of either maximization or minimization of some objective functions or uh, functions. So in case of economics or in microeconomics, when we go for optimization, then the, if we have varieties of uh, problems that we may optimize a single variable. Suppose y is uh, your uh, income and x is your, uh, sorry, y is consumption and x is income. So the, here only the dependent, the independent variable is uh, income. So how consumption is dependent on income? Now if I want to know where the, at what level of uh, um, income the consumption is maximum, then I have to go for two conditions. One is first order condition or it is called necessary condition. So to utilize, uh, to do this, we must utilize mathematics or the rule of derivative which is known as the differentiation. So in the derivative, the first order condition is that the derivative must be equal to zero. That is, we take the functions derivative, the first order derivative and we set it equal to zero. Whatever value we get, that value maximizes the function. Similarly, the second order condition is will because we, we may have the first order condition, it satisfies the necessary condition, but it is not sufficient. We may have, we do not know whether it is a maximum or whether it is a minimum. So therefore, for example, if suppose I take a function like this, suppose I take a U-shape function or I take a this uh, inverse U-shape function. So here the first order condition is satisfied here and the first order condition is satisfied also here. Here the f of the dy by dx is equal to 0. But it does not say, this condition does not say whether the
the function is minimum or maximum therefore we have to go for the second order condition second order condition will give guarantee that whether this is a minimum the function is attaining a minimum value or attaining a maximum value so the second order derivative is the for maximum the second order derivative must be less than zero that means again if you take the derivative d of dx of dy by dx this must be less than zero this this must be less than zero and for minimum the second order derivative should be greater than zero this should be greater than this should be greater than zero so this way we uh, use for the first order condition so for the single variable but if you have two variables like you have a uh, profit function so if we have a, uh, a profit function so in the profit function we have total revenue we have total cost so when so total revenue is a particular variable and total cost is a particular variable so whenever we differentiate this we have to see the how the uh, variable to so the first condition that the the derivative of with respect to revenue it must be zero the derivative of the cost function should be equal to zero and the second order condition is the slope of the cost function should be more than the slope of the revenue function that we do it but whenever we have uh, the uh, constraint maximization or constraint optimization problem then it has two parts the objective function and the second is the constraint of the set of constraint we may have single constraint we may have many constraint so the constraint may be uh, you have linear constraint you may have non linear constraint but generally we take in our consumer behavior or in, in the primary analysis or in the very general we take the linear constraints so uh, the objective function seeks to optimize that is either to maximize or minimize for example the consumer as an economic agent tries to maximize the utility or preference function or minimizes the expenditures on the commodity sub purchase subject to the utility constraint or maximization of profit revenue maximization of sales maximization of production and minimization of cost of production or minimization of losses so these are the objective functions which we utilize and on the other hand the constraints which we may utilize uh, in case of consumer uh, maximization uh, problem utility problem the constraints are the budget constraint and budget constraint may be the, it is actually the uh, prices of the commodity how much expenditure the consumer is doing out of his income so that is its constraint and we have maybe expenditure minimization problem where the constraint is the utility function the consumer is uh, restricted with a particular level of utility or particular level of uh, uh, preference level of uh, preference which is represented by the utility then cost minimization if you do cost minimization there the constraints are the uh, technology the, uh, the production function and in the profit maximization this is also a production function and sales maximization it is also maybe different constraints are there maybe the time period maybe the so many constraints will be there so now the when we do this type of constraint optimization which are frequently utilized the first order condition set the first derivative of the lagrangian composite function that means we have to that means suppose we have a utility function utility is a function of x and the budget function x1 x means this is f of x1 and x2 so now this is my utility function and now the budget constraint is the prices of the commodity p1 x1 plus p2 x2 which is equal to my money income which is given this is given out of this the consumer is spending so now there is a uh, uh, objective function 
there is a constraint. So now these two functions will be uh, composed or it will be a composite function by using the Lagrangian that is you will write like this a is equal to f of x1 comma x2 plus lambda m minus p1 x1 minus p2 x2 okay this is my Lagrangian composite function so the first order condition is you set the derivative of this where equal to zero with respect to each of the variables now the variables are x1 x2 and lambda so we take the differentiation dl by dx1 this should be equal to zero then dl with respect to dx2 it must be equal to zero and dl with respect to d lambda uh, d lambda it must be also equal to zero so this is the first one which are the equilibrium condition from this we get the equilibrium condition in case of consumer we get mar marginal rate of substitution equal to the price ratio similarly the uh, second condition is the differentiate the first derivative to get the second, second derivative and set its left and set it less than zero for maximum and greater than zero for minimum so again we have to differentiate this we have to differentiate this we have to differentiate the, this and if this is less than zero then the result we got maximum and if it is greater than zero we say that the value is minimum so now what it does the constraint maximization actually computes the marginal impact because when we do this what it actually does it does the computes the marginal that is the additional impact of the decision variable on the objective function so here in the case of consumer this is the objective function and the decision variable is x1 and x2 so how much additional x1 and x2 we create additional utility or it will add to the total utility that actually is obtained through this optimization problem the marginal reasoning is useful in the sense that no one is bothered about the initial position because we utilize marginal because the marginal does not say or does not bother about what happens to the initial how was the condition of the consumer what was his mental condition we are not bothered about his mental condition beforehand but only we will know if you will be given certain kind of uh, you take certain dose of consumption what will be the extra utility that will be added so the term marginal in microeconomics tells how much change in the dependent variable occurs resulting from an additional unit of an independent variable so this is also called rate of change and that is why we utilize derivative derivative is nothing but the rate of change or we call in geometry we call it slope of the function or we call it in a graph we call slope of the curve so that you can calculate in any way the, the words are different but the meanings will be same Statics. These are the second and the third point. The concept of equilibrium, which I will explain in detail when the equilibrium chapter will come. The concept of equilibrium is a condition or state of balancedness of a system that will continue indefinitely as long as the exogenous factors remain unchanged. That means if the factors, the external factors remain uh, kept fixed, then the system will continue in a balanced form without any uh, uh, time determination or a time factor. This equilibrium position is utilized in case of the economic agent to describe the position of unwillingness to deviate from that position. Whenever equilibrium is attained, the, if it is a consumer equilibrium, then the consumer will be unwilling to deviate from that position where he attained that equilibrium. If it is a producer's equilibrium, the producer will be unwilling to do that. If it is a market equilibrium, in the market, the total demand and total supply will be equal. So that's why it is a position or state of balance, which continues forever if there is no intervention of the external factors. This also helps understanding 
how the market for a product attains equilibrium position. The next one is the comparative statics. This is actually a tool which we utilize in, uh, in microeconomics. This is used to examine how a change in some exogenous variables will affect the changes in the endogenous variable. So that means it will explain if the parameters of the function are allowed to change, what will happen to the objective function. It compares to equilibrium situation. If in a particular period, if the equilibrium position is the initial position, and after that, if there are certain external factors are changed, what will be the new situation? So we can compare with the initial situation to the post-change situation. And these two things are called comparative statics. It's basically calculated with the constant optimization uh, tools. Next is the methodology because that actually helps us to understand how this microeconomics is actually approached, how it is studied, what kind of, uh, uh, what way the economists they analyze this. So it will determine the use of particular approach to the explanation and prediction of the individual economic agent because we have understood that we tell my economics as a science. So if it is a science, our microeconomics is part of economics, therefore it must be also a science or it must be a scientific analysis. Therefore, the question is whether the approach used in microeconomics is scientific or not. And microeconomics is a science because the structure of the theories consists of scientific approach and this structure of any kind of scientific uh, theories are A, B, C. A is assumptions. B is the body of the theory or the logical deductions and the C is conclusion of the theorems uh, that are uh, testable propositions which may be falsified or it may be accepted if you falsify, you go to assumptions, you change the assumptions, you re-verify with the data, then you come to the, again to the body of theory and you again conclude. So it is the ABC which is assumptions, logical deductions and the conclusions are the systematic or the structure of any kind of scientific theory. And microeconomics starting from the assumptions to conclusion is deductive. It is a priorism or approach or it may be inductive approach, empiric in approach which can be used. So we can utilize now two approaches, one is inductive or one is or, or another is deductive. A priori means not prior, reasoning goes from a cause to effect and represents beliefs and the concepts can be formed without any empirical evidence. That means I do not know, I cannot say anything, I cannot prove anything or any empirical evidence, but I have certain belief which can be uh, uh, represent, uh, which, uh, which can form the concept. And this is attributed to the 18th century philosopher Immanuel Kant. This is called Kantian philosophy, which actually based on this a priori approach or uh, inductive approach. So this, these are then mind without, these are then by mind. It is actually a thoughts in the mind. It does not require any kind of proof, any kind of empirical evidences. So these are uh, mind without experience or without experiment. The next one is the empiricism. From these axioms, logical deductions can be made that lead to conclusions or hypothesis that can be tested whether they correctly predict the reality or not. That means in empiricism, what we do, we from these axioms, we take, uh, get the data, we take the observed phenomena and we test them and we whether it is the test is actually correctly predicts the reality or not, that we discuss. So empiricism on the other hand argues that all knowledge comes from experience and is associated with William James who is a 19th century philosopher. So knowledge starts from experience through the collection of data. We get the knowledge not by mind but by collection of the observed fact. We know that the sun is rising from east to, uh, east to west. Uh, it sets, uh, rises in east and sets in west. So this is the observed phenomena which we uh, collect the data and we prove that okay, this statement is true. And similarly, and study of this information is used to infer the theory. We predict, we uh, forecast the theory. In microeconomics, empiricists 
relies on the statistical data. So that is the reason why the economists now are presently uh, using a lot of statistical data and applications of various statistical techniques of inferences to predict their uh, theories or to predict about their axioms in a more approximately in a correct manner. But, but there are certain controversies regarding these two types of method. The methodological controversy was to establish the scientific validity of the theory. In this regard, there are two contrasting views which we must know. One is the by Fredman and another is by Paul Samuelson. So the controversy is on how to judge a theory. This is the, that means what is the, what should be the method? What should be the method in microeconomics or economics as a broad subject? So according to Friedman, a theory is evaluated by its predictive power. If the theory predicts well, whatever may be the assumption, whatever may be the axioms, whether it is axioms of mind or whether it is axioms uh, based on the observed fact, doesn't matter. If it can predict well, if it gives you the more uh, picture of reality in a better way, then this is a better theory. So the truth or falsity of assumption is irrelevant. So then, so assumption whether it is true or false doesn't matter. It is the predictive power of the uh, theory is actually important. But on the other hand, Samuelson in 1963, he told about descriptive, uh, descriptivism or realism. That doctrine says that the assumptions or axioms of a theory must be realistic or must describe the reality. Instead of its uh, prediction, the he emphasized more on the axioms or the assumptions. He told assumptions must be real. If they are not real, then we cannot predict anything. And he sets out the scientific theory in a standard manner. Assumptions and the scientific approach or the structure of the scientific approach is assumptions. So he gave much emphasis on assumptions. If assumptions are true, then the theory will be true, its prediction will be true. Then the body of the theory and the consequences see. So, but this, uh, after that, Nazel in 1963, he actually made a compromise or a, he reached in a, in between the two positions, compromising between the two views. The next one is, the positions of micro versus macroeconomics. Now we must understand, if micro is there and macro is there, what is their positions, how they were, they were actually treated by economists from different times. From the very beginning, what we are currently called microeconomic and macroeconomic elements were present. Actually, if we study the history of economic thoughts, we will find everywhere, every economist, either they were uh, centered their views on microeconomic aspect or macroeconomic aspect. So the late scholastic philosophers were very much micro oriented in their concern with the satisfaction of individual. Actually, the, the scholastic philosophers actually the basis from which the marginal uh, uh, theory uh, uh, developed and it uh, brought a uh, important dimension. So this, uh, they give more emphasis on individuals and their satisfaction, their wants and their actions. But on the other hand, the mercantilists were preoccupied with the macro aggregates like money supply, inflation, level of employment, and questions of international trade. That means simultaneously both micro and macro ideas were coexisting. Then Smith, Adam Smith, Marshall, and Samuel Sam were concerned with both microeconomics and macroeconomics. These are the famous, they are the famous economists who simultaneously concerned about both of the your uh, things approaches microeconomics and macroeconomics. There is a cyclical pattern as far as which one dominates of uh, uh, one over the other. That means sometimes you find that microeconomics gets more prominent over macro and sometimes the macro gets more weightage over micro. So that this is a cyclical view. So microeconomics dominated in 19th and early 20th century. But macroeconomics of fairs dominated in the middle of the 20th century and then attention again focused on microeconomics at the end of the 20th century. The separation of the economic theory into distinct field of microeconomics and macroeconomics is relatively recent. That means recently we are making a very distinct 
separation of the economic theory into microeconomics and microeconomics. The eighth edition of Marshall's Principles of Economics, 1938, shows the discussions of both micro and macro. In book B, that discusses about micro, and book B, I discuss about your macro aspects. Then, the first dichotomy, that means for the, uh, dichotomy is the existence of both the things. Dichotomy between microeconomics and macroeconomics appears in the separation by Wixell in his lectures on political economy. For the first time, he separated in his uh, the volume which has uh, uh, published into two volumes. Volume 1, general theory, which is micro, and volume 2 is money, which is called macroeconomics. According to Marian, or Marian, 1987, Frisk had used the term microdynamic and macrodynamic in 1933, which is actually presently the uh, whatever microeconomics and macroeconomics mean today. However, these two terms were not coined until 1941 when they were introduced by D. Wolf. D. Wolf actually utilized the concept microeconomics and macroeconomics. So the most recent development is the micro foundations of macroeconomics and macroeconomics phenomena such as inflation and business cycle can be explained by the general framework of microeconomic theory which is by Lucas and he got Nobel Prize on this. So uh, we study which is called a new classical economics. That means every phenomena of macro can be explained with the help of the microeconomic foundations. So we are coming back to the microeconomic uh, theories and their, uh, their theories are utilized to understand these things. So then what are the success and failures of this microeconomic subject? So microeconomic theory has had considerable success in achieving its primary goal of meaningful explanation. As I told you, it deals with the explains, uh, explanation of the behavior of the economic agent. So the demand supply curve and single market in isolation is the best example. Nowadays, today, we explain how high the price of a particular commodity is rising or falling. It is because of the demand supply phenomenon. And this is the contribution of microeconomics, which is a success. But the problem is with the realism of the assumptions. There are so many assumptions which we are making or framing in order to have a theory. For example, money capital is separated from the production decision. When you study the producer farms uh, for production decision, we do not bring the money capital into, uh, into the consideration, only we bring uh, the technology. So that is also a uh, demerit or it's a, a failure. The fundamental assumption in general equilibrium component of microeconomics that the individual is exogenous that is unaffected by market forces. That means we always assume that the individual takes the decision but he or she is not affected by the market process. It is only his or her decision which affects the market. So in proper use of the tool, in many cases, the variable in question is treated as if it is cardinal without question. This is very, very important. For example, a food in production, child, quality in utility function, and family economics. So for example, now we'll take how this is actually, for example, over the domain of non-negative real number, the production function f of if we take the root of our x. If suppose we write f of this is root of our x, y is equal to root of our x. So now this is a profit function. If this is the production function, y is equal to root over x. So this is a production function which gives you maximum profit. But this function, if we change it to ordinary or by square it, if I suppose I make the square of this, this becomes a linear function. So if this will be a linear function, then there will be no maximization or the no unique maximum value exists. Because if the production function will be linear, the profit cannot be maximized. Because the more will be production, the more will be profit. So there will be uh, uh, infinite to, uh, profit will be obtained whenever the production expands. So therefore, this is actually whenever many economists 
they assume or uh, 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 before anything that this is cardinal, this is ordinal. Unlike physical sciences, the objects of the study are human activities. In microeconomics or in economics as a broad subject, our study depends or based on the human activities and their relation among human beings on which the microeconomics do not have control. Because we are dealing with the human agents on which the economics they do not have the control. But the physical scientists, they have, they do the experiment, the laboratory under which they have complete control over their experiments or over their values. So microeconomists do not have the same capacity as the physical scientists to establish the law of behavior. That is why we say economics is not science, it's a scientific approach. Because if we say science, it's not science as uh, So, that means, so that's we understood that the microeconomics will be a scientific approach. We always study in a uh, scientific approach by taking assumptions, or taking the body of the theory, and then we take the conclusions or the consequences which has been uh, emphasized by Samuelson. Of course, the Friedman has given much more emphasis on the predictive power because of that reason many statistical techniques have been devised and utilized by the uh, economists to uh, show the predictive power of the model. So in the next uh, content, uh, the next uh, week, because every week on um, Sunday, I will upload the new video. So please watch the video, you subscribe my channel, subscribe the, uh, like the video, share the video, share the content, give the feedback. This is my request to all of you to please to watch the video completely so that definitely you will get a lot of knowledge and not a lot of uh, uh, valuable things uh, for your uh, future career which you can utilize for your uh, best purposes. So my next video will be dealing with the central problems of an economy where we will utilize the concept of production possibility frontier then we will discuss the, the three important problems which almost all of you know but I will tell there what is this utilization of opportunity cost, what are its implications, how really the production possibility frontier is actually mathematically calculated. So this is all about my present video and today uh, the, this uh, I request all of you to watch, to share, to like and subscribe the, uh, the channel so that uh, I will be also interested to do uh, much more effort, uh, to put much more effort to give quality, uh, quality uh, videos on this microeconomics. So thank you everybody, thank you. I request all of you to watch the video, to subscribe my channel and share this among all your friends, all the students who are studying economics at any level, whether it is graduation, post-graduation, MA, MP, PhD, wherever, even the, those who are practicing their education as a career or professionals, they also can uh, watch this video. So thank you, thank you everybody, thank you.